Hello and welcome to our demo on automated governance. My name is Ryan. I'm joined here by Alex. Uh, automated governance can be an ambiguous term. Uh, I'll describe what we'll show today is how to create trusted verifiable artifacts and artifact metadata in CI and how that metadata can become actionable information for governance and security policies. Now, everything we'll be demoing today is publicly accessible on GitHub. Uh, depending upon how you came across this video, you might already have a link, but if you don't, just go to the Liatrio organization and you can filter by either the automated governance topic or as well, all the repositories are prefixed with GH trusted builds. So let's go into the app repo first. Now, everything we're demoing today also closely follows along with the readme in the app repo. Uh, this readme is really thorough. So if there's a point where we go too fast or uh, there's a piece that you maybe want to dig a little bit deeper into, you can also come back to the readme and go to the specific section and find uh, any more relevant information. Uh, as well, there's a few things before we really get into the demo that we kind of want to define up front, some terms and technologies that will be coming up quite often uh, during our demo. So uh, the first one is the term attestation. An attestation is a signed statement about a software artifact. Um, in other more plain words, uh, an attestation is metadata about some aspect of an artifact, such as a Docker image or a software library that's been certified by a trusted party. Um, there is a, a particular structure to an attestation, but we'll, we'll be looking at a number of attestations examples in our demos, and we'll go into the uh, a little more in detail later on. Uh, next is Salsa. Salsa is a security framework originally published by Google and the Open Source Security Foundation, uh, but it's kind of become an industry uh, consensus group. And Salsa tries to lay out best practices and standards for how to securely produce software artifacts, how to secure your software supply chain, uh, but also how to document and communicate what security thresholds an artifact has achieved. Um, that way then consumers of artifacts uh, know a little bit more about what risks they might be taking on if they use this artifact and as well what went into producing it. Um, a lot of the concepts and resources that we'll be seeing in the demo today are coming from the Salsa framework. Next, I uh, kind of want to talk a bit about SigStore. SigStore is a suite of open source tools that are, are meant to help with uh, a lot of the common actions and things you need to do in securing software supply chains. The first one is Cosign. Cosign is a command line tool for signing and verifying OCI artifacts, uh, other blobs, uh, attestations, uh, making sure attestations are uploaded to the correct places. Uh, this is uh, the tool that we'll be directly using in a number of the workflows that we'll be looking at in a moment. Next is Recore Transparency Log. So it's one thing to be making attestations about artifacts, but you also have to think about where you are storing them. Um, using, say, a cloud provider's generic object storage isn't quite good enough because of how much that can be changed and potentially a lack of security around that. The Recore Transparency Log is designed to be an append-only storage solution, and as well, it has a number of features that allow third parties to monitor and actually validate that the log hasn't been tampered with in any way, that somebody hasn't attempted to change an attestation or delete attestations. Uh, finally here, I also want to talk about Fulcio. Uh, Fulcio is a certificate authority for enabling keyless signing. So there's going to be a lot of signing of things in the demo today, signing of Docker images, signing of attestations, etc. The signing can be done with static keys and more traditional uh, PKI or even cloud KMS. But with all of those, um, you still kind of have the burden of operations and auditing and security controls that go around that. Uh, keyless signing alleviates a lot of that as well. Keyless signing does a better job of blending identity into the signing process. 
So in our demo day, we'll also be showing keyless signing. Uh, another note is ReCore and Falsio are um, separate applications, separate processes. These can be self-hosted in a private environment, but for our demo, we'll be using the public instances that SigStore host and make available. SigStore refers to these as the public good instances of ReCore and Falsio. So next, let's take a look at the workflows repo. Uh, so this is kind of the, the last term here that we want to call out. We'll be using the term trusted workflows quite a bit in the demo. Uh, when we say that, we're referring to the GitHub Actions reusable workflows that live in this repository. These are meant to represent hardened reusable workflows that a platform team or a security team have made and owned and are available for delivery teams to consume. These are things that uh, the central teams want to make sure are done in a particular way, done in a secure way, uh, maybe encompassing any sort of elevated access or secrets. And as well, this is where you want to make the unforgeable trusted metadata uh, about what happened for all these individual steps. Um, these workflows could live in, in different repositories if they're owned by different teams, but just for demo purposes, uh, we have have them all living in one repo. Uh, a lot of the concepts that we'll be going over in our demo, these could be implemented in other CI CD platforms as well, but for our demo, we just happen to be using uh, GitHub Actions and GitHub Actions does have a nice feature set of boundaries and security controls that lend reusable workflows well to automated governance um, items. So for example, Callers of reusable workflows cannot uh, affect how the reusable workflow runs really in any way outside of what's explicitly defined by the reusable workflow itself. So for example here, um, the only thing that a caller can input or give to a workflow uh, to potentially change how it runs is explicitly defined as an input. And as well, they can only access what is explicitly allowed as an output. So this means that callers can't arbitrarily override jobs defined by the reusable workflow, maybe skipping jobs or changing the run to use potentially a different tool altogether. Um, and as well, reusable workflows run in a separate environment from the caller. They always run on a separate uh, VM from the calling workflow. So as well, there's no, there's no shared environment for a caller as well to affect or access anything from a reusable workflow. Another piece that is really important from GitHub Actions is the OIDC functionality. Uh, now this is something like many other things that we'll be going in in detail later on in the demo, but at a high level with the OIDC token functionality, we're able to uniquely identify when a process is running from a reusable workflow. So that allows us to use more trusted identity in a lot of the creation of attestations, but as well control access to any sort of external secrets or um, other sensitive material. So with that, um, let's go back to the app repo. Uh, kind of start our demo here. Uh, so this app repo is meant to represent uh, an average product team's application. Uh, if we go take a look at it, it happens to be a Golang app. If you were to run this, it'd be able to serve a number of HTTP requests. Uh, if we also go look at their dependency list, uh, pretty small footprint here, just one external dependency that we happen to be using. We also find a Docker file here. So this application is meant to be uh, built and packaged up as a Docker image to then be deployed to any container-based environment or platform. Uh, later on our demo, we'll be using Kubernetes as our target platform, but uh, overall pretty straightforward uh, multi-stage Docker image here. And then if we could take a look at their GitHub Actions workflows, they have just one here called app. Just looking over this, we can see this is a, a workflow that the product team still owns. They're still able to compose this themselves uh, with four jobs that they happen to have in here are all using a trusted workflow from either the platform or uh, the security team, as we can see here. 
Um, but otherwise, at a high level, uh, steps that we would expect to see exist in any CI, CD pipeline, such as building and publishing our image, running a security scan. Um, this will be coming into detail later on in the demo, but uh, doing some of our policy verification. And then as well, we'll have an example deployment um, of this app to show, show some of the uh, concepts. But now let's go to pull requests. Uh, we have a prepared change already to this app. Uh, we see we're just making a small code change and we have all green check marks. So this PR has met any sort of required status checks. And as well, Alex has approved this change as well. This is an important note uh, later on, but overall everything is green. So we are going to merge this change. And we can come to the action tab and see that we have already started a workflow run from that. Uh, so now I hand it over to Alex, who's going to start going into detail uh, on this workflow and, and some of those trusted workflows that this app is using. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, so like Ryan mentioned earlier, uh, we've got two teams in this demo, a platform team that are responsible for providing an environment uh, for developers to deploy their applications to, as well as tooling uh, to help developers build and deploy their applications. We've also got a security team, and they're responsible for making sure that the artifacts that are deployed to that environment meet uh, internal security standards. Uh, so what I'm going to walk us through is that first um, workflow, the build and push workflow. It's owned by the platform team. And we'll just go job by job uh, and use that to examine some of the uh, concepts uh, in this demo. Uh, so the first job is the build uh, job. Uh, what this is going to do is build a container image uh, from the app team's uh, source code. Uh, and this job is very deliberately uh, spun out from the rest of the workflow. Um, the reason is uh, this is a step where we're actually executing untrusted code uh, from the application team in order to build the container image. And so um, because of the nature of uh, GitHub Actions, um, this build job is going to run on a separate VM, uh, and each job uh, subsequently is also going to get their own uh, virtual machine. So there's nothing that this build job can do that can persist and affect um, later jobs uh, in this workflow. Uh, the other security consideration is the uh, permissions we give to the GitHub token. Uh, so you can see here that we've only given it the contents read permission, uh, which is necessary in order to check out the source code repository. Uh, also, just in general, we've tried to annotate each of these jobs uh, in all of the workflows with uh, their minimum set of permissions uh, and some description as to uh, why we need those permissions. So outside of those uh, security considerations, this is otherwise a fairly standard uh, container image build. Uh, we're choosing the Docker GitHub Actions to build the image. Um, we export it as a tar file um, and upload that artifact uh, for other jobs to use. Uh, so next job... Uh, we'll take a look at here is the push job. This is going to take that tarball from earlier and upload it to GitHub Container Registry. Before we do that, however, we're going to use a tool from Google called Crane uh, to compute the uh, digest of the tarball. Uh, the reason is that uh, throughout this demo, we're going to refer to the container image not by a particular tag, but by its digest, which uniquely identifies it and cannot change. Um, and we compute this digest locally rather than trusting the value that comes back from the registry, uh, as this is what we're going to use to uh, sign it. So we want to make sure we knew exactly what we gave the registry is exactly what we get back. Uh, the other thing to call out here, uh, it's not a particular concern uh, with GitHub Container Registry if you're using the built-in uh, GitHub token to authenticate. Um, but if you were to use a central registry, something like an Artifactory or ECR, uh, it might be the case that whatever... Uh, is running this job, has greater permissions to that uh, registry, um, and could potentially be manipulated into pushing uh, to a different repository um, and uh, overriding uh, images. So uh, what we've done here is carefully controlled the repository that we're pushing to, so it just matches the source code uh, repository path, the Oregon repository. Um, Again, not as much of a concern with GitHub Container Registry if you're using the built-in GitHub token because it's already going to be naturally scoped. Uh, so next job uh, is the uh, sign job, which is going to sign the image that we just uploaded to the registry. Before uh, we dive into the signing, though, I'm going to take a brief segue into a GitHub Actions feature um, that's, that kind of underlies the signing. 
So GitHub Actions has support uh, for a subset of OpenID Connect or OIDC. OIDC uh, is an extension of OAuth2 that adds, among other things, this idea of an ID token that represents some uh, user, maybe logging into a web application, or it can also represent a machine or service account, you know, some automated uh, process. And in the case of GitHub Actions, it represents kind of an instance of a uh, job running in a particular workflow. So if we take a look uh, at this example in the readme, which is kind of a portion of that uh, ID token uh, decoded. We can see there's a lot of metadata in here uh, about the repository and the org uh, that this is running in, uh, as well as how the workflow was started, who started it. And more importantly for us, there's this job workflow ref claim. And what this does is if the job is defined in terms of a reusable workflow, um, then this includes the path to that workflow. So we can see the org and repo, which is our workflows repo. Uh, we can see the path to the reusable workflow as well as the ref uh, that was used to pull it in. Uh, this will become important later on. We'll see this claim again. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about uh, with relation to OIDC is how we can verify the these tokens and trust that they came from GitHub. Uh, there is a standard claim, uh, the ISS or issuer claim, and what this is is the name of the server that issued uh, the token. So in this case, we can see it was tokenactions.githubusercontent.com. Uh, and another feature of OpenID Connect is this idea of uh, OADC discovery. Uh, so if you take um, that issuer URL and you uh, append uh, .wellknown slash OpenID configuration, make a request, uh, you can get back a JSON document that describes a number of things about the OpenID uh, provider, including the types of claims that will be in the token, uh, the types of signatures that it supports. Uh, but most importantly for us, uh, there's this JOX URI. Uh, this stands for uh, JSON Web Key Set. Uh, and why this is important is GitHub uh, Actions is going to sign these tokens with a private key that only they control, but we need uh, of the corresponding public key in order to validate uh, these tokens. So uh, what this does is give us a programmatic way to retrieve uh, the public uh, key for these uh, private keys that are used to sign the tokens. And then we can verify that a token actually came from GitHub Actions. Uh, you'll see here that there's multiple uh, keys in use, and there's a key ID field uh, in the token that we can use to match up with which particular key uh, was used and trust that this came from GitHub Actions, assuming the signature checks out. So switching gears a little bit back to the signing. Uh, so if we take a look at this. Uh, we're going to use we're going to use a couple of the six door uh, tools that Ryan touched on uh, earlier. So the first is Cosign. Uh, it started off as a tool for container image signing, but kind of broadened out a bit to include um, signing attestations as well as uh, arbitrary files through its blob support. Uh, the other uh, six-door tool that's involved uh, in this flow here is Falsio. Falsio is a certificate authority for code signing. Um, the analogy that the six-door project uh, likes to use is that it's like uh, Let's Encrypt, um, but for code signing certificates instead of uh, TLS certificates that you might put in front of a web server. Um, and like Ryan mentioned in the intro, um, the Sigstor project runs what they call a public good instance of Falsio that anyone can use in order to uh, sign their container images or attestations, and that's what we're going to be using here. So we're going to do something um, that the Sigstor project calls keyless signing, and how that's going to work is uh, we're just pretty simple invocation of cosign sign uh, and give it our container image. Um, and um, we're going to launch into the keyless signing flow, uh, which is a bit of a misnomer as quite literally the first step is Cosign is going to generate a random public-private key pair uh, to use to sign the image. Now, for someone verifying the signature, there's no reason to trust the signature of any random you know, private key. Uh, so what Cosign wants is a code signing certificate from Falsio uh, with the idea being that the public key that it just generated will be in the certificate and that certificate will chain back up to the Falsio root. So if you trust the Falsio root, you can trust the contents of the certificate that's used to sign the container image. Uh, however, what Falsio wants um, before it can grant a certificate is uh, it has, needs a couple of prerequisites. First, it needs to know who the caller is. And the way that uh, it supports that is through using that ID token that we mentioned earlier. So this job has the ID token write permission uh, which is going to allow um, us to request that ID token that we saw earlier with all these claims in it. And Cosign can tell based on the presence of environment variables that it's running in GitHub Actions, so it'll go ahead and acquire that ID token. The next thing uh, that it needs to provide to Fulcio is some proof that it controls that private key 
of the key pair that I just generated earlier. And the way that works is by convention. So there is in uh, all of these IED tokens, there's a sub or subject field that describes the name main entity um, that's being described in the token. And so since it's a commonplace field, the convention with Fulcio is to grab the value of the subject claim and then sign that with the private key to prove that um, the caller does control the private key. So with all of that in place, uh, Cosign will make the request to Fulcio. It'll pass it the public key that it just generated, um, the ID token that it got from GitHub Actions, and then that proof of possession of the private key that was made by signing the subject claim value. Now, Fulcio is configured to support a number of OpenID Connect issuers. One of them is GitHub uh, Actions. And so it'll do, uh, it'll look at the issuer claim uh, that we saw earlier, uh, see that it's GitHub Actions. It'll request the um, discovery document uh, that we saw and then follow that through to get the JOX URI. Uh, and then it can uh, find, look up the right key based on the key ID and check the signature of the token that was provided. Assuming that all checks out, it'll all move on to check the uh, challenge that was provided to make sure that that um, signature verifies successfully. And assuming everything checks out, it'll issue a certificate back to Cosign. Uh, and then Cosign will uh, sign the image and then upload that signature. Uh, so it's actually going to store the signature uh, in the container registry. So if we look here in GHCR, uh, we can see we have some tags that were pushed recently. This is the uh, application image that was just built by the build job. Uh, and then we have a couple of other tags here that look maybe a little strange. Uh, so the signature is actually stored outside of the image. It, it's stored in a tag um, that's kind of uh, decided by convention. So uh, it takes the digest of the image uh, and then appends this dot sig. Uh, so that's the actual content of the signature. Uh, but in order to verify the signature, uh, we need uh, the certificate that was issued from Falsio. So uh, what Cosign will do is it'll upload that certificate and proof of the signature to the a supply chain transparency log that'll record the signature and the certificate uh, so that later on we go to validate uh, the image, we can see um, that the cert what the certificate, uh, which certificate was used. So if we take a look at the raw log entry, see there's not much to it. There's a hash of the signature uh, and then this public key block, which contains a certificate. So if we look at the decoded certificate. Uh, there's a number of things to call out. Uh, so first of all, we can see it was issued by the SIGSTOR project. Uh, we can see that it's a very short-lived certificate. It's only valid for 10 minutes. And then down here in the extensions, we can see that the subject alt name uh, list includes our reusable workflow uh, at that uh, at a particular ref. And then uh, down here, there's a list of uh, extensions in the Folsio certificate. And one of them is the OIDC issuer field, uh, which this is the uh, issuer of the ID token that was used to mint this certificate. And we see that that was GitHub Actions. We also see that there's a lot of other metadata down here, uh, like the repository and the branch. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as well as a few other things. Uh, and all of that information came from the uh, ID token earlier. So a lot of this information ends up mapped back into the certificate itself. And this lets you do uh, things like say, I only want uh, to trust an image if it came from the build and push workflow uh, running in the app repo on the main branch. Uh, so you get very fine grained with a level uh, of verification. So before we move on, I'll just talk a little bit about the benefits of keyless signing. So uh, the obvious benefit is you don't have to manage uh, static, static keys, uh, even if you're using something like a cloud KMS uh, service. Uh, you still have to um, audit the usages of that key, make sure it's rotated, uh, control access to it. Um, there's uh, still an overhead uh, to the key. But uh, with uh, keyless signing, you don't have to control the key and uh, you really don't have to worry about the key material because after the signing uh, occurs, it's just discarded. And the only real proof of it is the public key that lives on in the certificate. Uh, so that private key never hits disk. It never leaves the virtual machine um, that we're using. Um, and even if it were uh, to somehow be leaked, it's not useful anymore because the certificate expiry is so short. Um, it has a very limited uh, use. But more fundamentally, uh, the main value proposition of keyless signing is that idea I was mentioning earlier of, of um, how a 
possession of a key is not necessarily a proof uh, or a statement about identity. It just means, you know, whoever the signer has access to the key. But with keyless signing, you get this idea of a certificate, which is a public key plus an assertion of identity. And so you get very uh, detailed information about the signer, which in this case is our build and push workflow. Uh, and you get a lot of metadata that you can use uh, to get even more fine grain about what you do or don't trust necessarily. So that's uh, the keyless signing. Now, the rest of this workflow uh, is concerned with generating attestations. Uh, the first attestation we'll look at uh, is provenance. Uh, and this is a concept that's um, really a big part of the Salsa framework. And provenance is this idea of knowing for a, a container uh, or really any artifact, um, how was that artifact made and from what source code uh, was it made? So uh, the uh, Salsa project provides a number of tools uh, to help with that, and we're using one of their tools here, the Salsa generator um, for container images. So we'll just run that in our workflow, and that'll output uh, an attestation that we can use cosine a test to sign and upload. So if we take a look um, in the container registry, uh, we can see that there is another tag that's very similar to the signature. So this is Cosign's uploaded the provenance attestation and all of the attestations in this workflow uh, actually to uh, UCI registry. So we can see it has that same convention of the SHA-256 digest with the dot uh, at extension. So this is the attestation bundle. And again, uh, it's going to upload that certificate as well as the um, some information about the attestation to Rickor. So we can take a look uh, in the log for that. So uh, since this is the first attestation, we're seeing a concrete example of. I'll just touch on the format a little bit. So uh, there is uh, something called the Intoto project, which is a supply chain security tool. Uh, and one of the one of its contributions is this idea, or is this uh, common attestation format that's uh, kind of gained wide use even outside of the Intoto project. And um, that's what we're going to be uh, using here. So it has uh, three kind of main fields of note. The first is the subject. This is a list of software artifacts. Um, the next is the predicate. This is some data about that software artifact, uh, describes it. Uh, and lastly is the predicate type, uh, which tells you the structure and kind of schema of the predicate that you can expect if you are trying to handle these attestations programmatically. So if we take a look at the predicate type, uh, we can see it's salsa dev provenance. Uh, if we take a look at our subjects, we can see we only have a single subject and it's the container image that we built uh, earlier in the build job. Now there's quite a bit to the Salsa uh, provenance predicate. I'll skip over uh, most of it. We'll just highlight a couple of fields here. Uh, the first one is this builder ID. Uh, so this is who built our container image and it's uh, rightfully pointing to our build and push workflow uh, along with which ref uh, we used. Uh, there's a build type here, uh, which just, uh, this is our uh, container generator that we ran in the pipeline. So it tells us this was a container build. Uh, and lastly, way at the bottom, uh, there's a list of materials that went into this artifact. And we can see we've got a single material, and it is our uh, application source code repository. And we also have information about the commit uh, that was used to build this. So now we have an assertion that says for this particular container image, uh, we built it using the build and push workflow uh, from this exact commit. Now, we mentioned that uh, these attestations are signed. Uh, and if we take a look at the uh, raw uh, log entry here, we can see that it looks very similar. We have uh, a couple of uh, digests and then this public key block with certificate. Uh, unfortunately, it's not decoded nicely for us, but if we take a look in the uh, using the Rickor API, we can grab that log entry and decode the certificate. Uh, and we see it looks pretty similar to what we saw before is issued by the Sigstore project. Um, the subject alt name includes our build and push workflow. Uh, and then there's all this metadata down here, including the OADC issuer, which was GitHub Actions. So that's the Providence uh, attestation. The next one we'll take a look at is uh, the Software Bill of Materials attestation. So Providence is how something or how a container was built uh, and what went into it. The uh, Software Bill of Materials is the actual contents uh, of that container. Uh, there's a number of different uh, competing formats and tools uh, for working with SBOMs. The format we're using here is uh, SPDX from the Linux Foundation, and we're using a tool from SIFT, uh, a tool called SIFT, uh, to generate that container image uh, SBOM. And so that'll output uh, a JSON file that is the SBOM, and then we can use cosine a test, uh, which has some native support for working with SBOMs, to sign and upload that as an attestation. 
So if we take a look at that uh, in Rekor, uh, we can see the predicate type this time is uh, spdx.dev slash document. Uh, you can see the subject list is the same. We're still talking about uh, the image that we just uh, created. Uh, and then there's quite a bit of information here in the predicate. Uh, again, just not going to go through all of this because, um, but there are a few things that are important to highlight. Uh, so part of the SBOM is a list of all the files in the artifact. It's a pretty simple um, container, so we don't we don't have much. Uh, it's a multi-stage build where the final stage just copies over a binary uh, that was built earlier. So the only real file in here is our server binary. Uh, and if we scroll down a little bit, we can see uh, there's a list of packages or dependencies that went into the container image. Uh, and we can see uh, here our single dependency that Ryan showed earlier, the Google UUID package. Uh, it's also captured the version of the UUID package that we're using. Um, so there's a couple of different uses for uh, SBOMs. Um, first uh, one, one thing you can do is uh, license uh, compliance. So um, typically these uh, SBOMs will include some licensing information. So if there's a particular uh, set of open source licenses that aren't permitted at an enterprise, uh, this is a good place for policy to uh, come in and you can um, take a look at all the packages that are listed uh, in, for a particular uh, container and make sure that none of them violate those licensing standards. Um, another use for SBOMs is vulnerability management. So as a hypothetical, let's say there's a vulnerability in the Google UUID package that affects versions uh, less than 1.4.0. Well, uh, if we were to scan this container image, if that scan happened before the vulnerability was known, there's going to be nothing in the report uh, that helps us. But uh, if we had an SBOM for the container image, what we can do is um, look at all of the packages uh, in there and see if we're using the UUID package, and if we are, what version, uh, and see using that uh, SBOM information to see if we are um, affected by this particular vulnerability. So that is, uh, that's the SBOM attestation. The last uh, attestation type that we're gonna look at here uh, is a little different from the other two. So uh, those first two are from kind of well-established open source projects uh, like the Salsa framework uh, or the Linux Foundation. But uh, this last uh, attestation is actually a custom one. So we wrote a tool called GH Trusted Builds Attestation that supports uh, generating a couple different types of attestations. Uh, and the one we're looking at here is a code review or pull request attestation. So it's often a requirement at, a comp at large companies to uh, enforce code review uh, so that every change must have some minimum threshold of reviewers. And that's what this is doing is that uh, we run the attestation tool and it looks at the commit that it's on, finds any associated pull requests, and then for each pull request, it makes an attestation. So if we take a look at that attestation in Rekor, <clears throat> we can see the predicate type is our custom GitHub pull request type. Uh, we can see the subjects looks a little different uh, than what we saw before. The first subject is uh, the application repository uh, at the commit that we built from. Uh, and that makes sense because it's the one associated with the pull request. Uh, the next subject, however, is the container image, uh, which isn't described at all in the predicate, but it's here because of uh, how we are storing these attestations. So each attestation is going to wind up in uh, the registry at this particular tag. And something that Cosign is going to do when it verifies an attestation uh, is check that the subject list includes the container image at that digest. This is to prevent someone from, uh, say, copying a, an attestation from a valid image to an invalid one uh, because the digest won't match the subject list. And if they change the uh, subject array at all, it'll break the signature. So it's more of a security precaution, even though it's not actually um, described by the predicate in this case. But if we take a look uh, at the predicate, it's, uh, I can see there's a lot of metadata about a particular pull request, um, like when it was created, who merged it, a uh, link to the pull request. Uh, but of interest to us is uh, these last couple of fields, because these are something you could use to write policy. So uh, we have a list of everyone who contributed to the pull request, uh, and we also have a list of everyone who reviewed the pull request, as well as a link to their last review and whether they approved it or not. And finally, uh, we have this aggregate approval field, uh, which is true if everyone who reviewed it approved it, false otherwise. Now, um, this attestation lets us write uh, policy uh, around these source code uh, review requirements uh, in a couple of different ways. First, just the presence or absence of this attestation says there was or wasn't a pull request. Uh, so that's kind of the simplest policy that you can write. 
um, the next uh, policy that you could write is uh, checking whether that pull request was approved. Uh, you could go further and say you must have had some minimum threshold of reviewers. Or if you wanted to go even uh, further, you could say I don't want anyone who contributed to the pull request uh, for their review to count towards that minimum threshold. Now, a lot of controls uh, like these are already built into GitHub and other source control platforms. Um, but this attestation isn't intended to be a replacement uh, or alternative for these uh, controls. It's really more of a complement uh, to them because ideally those controls are on and there is some process that is reconciling those uh, settings uh, should they drift from whatever approved baseline. Uh, but it's often the case that you need to give developers some level of access uh, in order to do their jobs. And so this opens up the possibility that uh, someone will try to sneak in an unapproved change uh, or maybe someone's account was compromised uh, and someone was able to uh, maliciously commit some code. Uh, what this will do is uh, you'll have a still have a point in time snapshot for a particular pull request about what happened regardless of the state of those settings in the repository. Uh, so if you had a policy that says there must be a pull request attestation and someone turns off the branch protections and pushes straight to main, there's still some evidence um, that the normal process wasn't wasn't followed, uh, and we can fail policy or block deployments based on that. So that's the last type of attestation that's generated in this build and push workflow. Uh, just to kind of recap uh, what we did here, we built a container image, we pushed it to GitHub uh, container registry, uh, we signed the image with cosign and keyless signing, we made a provenance attestation that says um, how a particular uh, or how this image was built and the source code it was built from. We made a software bill of materials attestation that says what are the contents and dependencies of this image. And lastly, we made a an attestation that says this change was uh, peer reviewed or not. Um, <clears throat> so those are the types of attestations that a potentially platform team might be interested in. I'm going to pass it over to Ryan. He can talk about the types of attestations that a security team might want uh, and how uh, we can use attestations to gate deployments. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so, yep, we're going to take a look at uh, some trusted workflows from the security team. Uh, this next one here will be a security scan or a vulnerability scan, something a security team would commonly want to have done. Uh, this is something that a security team would want to make sure was using their preferred tool for vulnerability scanning, making sure it was configured in the right way. It wasn't um, accidentally getting configurations that would skip vulnerabilities or potentially a, a different image was passed uh, as the one that should be scanned, for an example. Uh, here we also happen to be using Trivi, which is an open source vulnerability scanner from Aqua Security. Um, this could be really any other security scanner. And here we're just running Trivi uh, on our published image. And then as well, we are making another attestation at this point, uh, similar to what we have seen from the build and push workflow. So we can uh, take a look at the security scan attestation and recore, uh, start with the predicate type. We can see this is from SigStore. It is a vulnerability attestation type. Uh, this is a more generic format for vulnerabilities for uh, any, any tools to report to. Trivi happens to put out a results format that matches the schema for this predicate. Again, our subject is the Docker image. And taking a look at the predicate, uh, just some interesting fields to call out about it. We can see here what specific scanner and version of that scanner we used to generate this. Um, potentially, if the tool was reporting any of its CVE or security database information could be recorded as well. Um, any metadata about the image that we scan. So for example, it's architecture, any configuration uh, pieces here, any labels, etc. And if we scroll down as well, uh, if there were any vulnerabilities found, we would see a results field here. Uh, but because our demo app is a pretty small footprint, only has one uh, dependency as well that happens to be clean, so we don't have any results to show here, uh, any vulnerability results in our attestation. As well, we can take a look at the signer identity of that attestation, um, like we've seen on the other ones. Uh, this is well coming from the trusted workflows, specifically our scan image reusable workflow. So now that we've made a handful of example attestations, or in other words, trusted unforgeable metadata about this artifact, uh, how do we make this actionable? How do we bring this together with governance and security policies? What we're going to do next 
is create what's called a verification summary attestation or VSA. Uh, VSA is uh, another resource and a concept from Salsa framework. Uh, a VSA's purpose is to show that an artifact has successfully reached a specific security threshold uh, based on the collection of verified attestations for the artifact that were given as input to a policy. So uh, to detail that a little more, we'll go take a look at the VSA that was created uh, during this run. As well, this VSA is another thing that we are uh, creating from the custom attestations repo that Alex mentioned earlier for our source attestation. Here's our log ID and recore and looking at the VSA attestation. Now uh, we have our predicate here. Uh, this is again defined by the Salsa project for verification summary. Our subject is the image and looking at the predicate here, the first field input attestations. This is a collection of independently verified attestations for the artifact, uh, meaning, for example, that all these signatures have been validated on these attestations. Uh, we can see there's four of them here, so that matches up with the number of attestations that we made during this workflow run. If we remember, we made our provenance, SBOM, pull request, and then our security scan attestations. And as well, if you wanted to review those, you could see uh, the URI for each one of these. And then next is the policy. So what policy were these attestations given to as input? Um, so we can see here the full URI. That happens to be uh, the fourth repository as part of our demo. Uh, this is an open policy agent or OPA policy bundle. Uh, it's a pretty simple policy just for demo purposes. But we can go take a look at some of the pull request uh, rules that we have defined in our policy. Um, so you can see that we're wanting to enforce that pull requests have at least one reviewer. Uh, if there's less than one reviewer on a pull request, that will create a violation in our policy, which will ultimately fail um, on an evaluation. So if we come back to the VSA, we have our verified attestations that were given as input to our policy that we just looked at. And then finally, the result of that evaluation is recorded in the verification result field here. And you can see we have passed, meaning this artifact has passed uh, the rules outlined by our governance or our security policy. Now, if you're making a externally consumable artifact, like a software library for third parties, um, you might be able to stop here. You can make a VSA and then make that discoverable alongside however you're publishing your artifact. That way then consumers would be able to come here, see what kind of threshold or scrutiny this artifact has passed. And as well, if they wanted to do their own independent verification of anything, this would be the starting point for any attestations that would exist. Um, but what we wanna to show today is how to automate enforcement of your government security policies uh, by your deployment platform. So come back to our workflow here. And our last job is an example deployment of this app to a target platform, in this case, Kubernetes. Um, to avoid having to stand up some separate infrastructure for this demo to kind of keep it um, everything here all together nicely in one workflow run, we're standing up a lightweight Kubernetes cluster inside of this job. And then as well for the enforcement point, of this Kubernetes based platform, we're using uh, one more tool from SigStore, which is called the SigStore Policy Admission Controller. So the admission controller, when it's deployed to a Kubernetes cluster, you can configure it to uh, watch a, a given namespace or namespaces and any resources coming in with defined images on them, such as containers in a Kubernetes deployment. Uh, you can have the policy admission controller run any configured checks on that image to see whether or not this resource should be allowed to be applied to the cluster. So let's take a look at our uh, policy here in our example. Uh, this is the kind of inline policy that we are giving to the admission controller. Um, ultimately, this is doing a few things for every image that is being deployed. It is looking at one, has the image been signed? by our 
build and push workflow identity. So we, we've trusted the builder of this image. And then as well as looking for valid verification summary attestations that were made by our, our trusted workflow for making VSAs. And then it's making sure that the VSA has a verification result of passed. So ultimately this has to be signed by our expected identity. It has to have a valid VSA. And as well, it has to be a successful VSA. This has to have passed our security policy to be deployed. And we can see here, just a reminder that we have a, a pass result. So if we come here, we can see it's already green, uh, but we'll step through it here. We're uh, installing and creating our lightweight Kubernetes cluster. We're deploying the SIGStore policy admission controller and configuring it with that policy that we just looked at. And then finally, we're attempting to uh, deploy our application to that cluster. Here, we're just using kubectl in line to create a Kubernetes deployment. Um, this policy admission controller would work with both push style deployments, such as what we're doing here, as well as pull based. If you're using pull based continuous delivery tool like Argo CD um, and work in, in any of these cases, but we can see the deployment has successfully rolled out. And if we also show some of the resources in our namespace, we can see that our pod uh, is running as well. So this is the, the happy path when an application has gone through all of the expected steps for meeting governance or platform or security requirements, then it's allowed to deploy. But to actually show all this coming together to enforce policy, we need to show a failed deployment. So if we go to pull requests, and we can see that while we were taking a look at some of those uh, last few workflows that Alex went ahead and made an unapproved change to the app repository. Uh, we can see here it kind of reverted the change we made earlier. And somehow he was able to merge these changes without a reviewer on them. So as we know, looking at the policy, this, this should fail because it did not have a reviewer on it. So let's go to the workflow run uh, for that change. And Kind of going through uh, again the same the same jobs from our trusted reusable workflows. Uh, let's go take a look at the pull request attestation first for this change. So we can see it looks a little different than the original change that we walked through. We can see that the reviewers, for example, is an empty list, and the aggregate approved field here is is false. Uh, next, if we move on to the VSA, find our VSA in ReCore. So overall, kind of looks similar to what we've seen before. We have another set of four uh, attestations. We're using the same policy bundle. Um, to evaluate those attestations. But now we can see that we have a verification result of failed. And this is because it failed from missing reviewers. There wasn't at least one reviewer on that change. So this, this artifact ultimately has failed our security requirements. It should not be deployed. And we can see that here with our, our failed uh, test deployment. Again, went through standing up the cluster, deploying, configuring our policy controller. And now we can see that when we attempted to create a deployment, we now have an error. So before when it was a successful change, uh, that was kind of transparent to the delivery team. They're not really have to be aware of um, any sort of policy enforcement happening at that time. But now that this failed, we're getting an error back. Uh, we can see that it's from, from SIGStore admission controller. And ultimately it's saying it's failed the check for has passing VSA, it's not compliant. So in other words, our platform did not allow this artifact to be deployed because it was not up to our governance and security standards. So uh, just kind of summarize again here, the, the end of the live demo portion, everything we've walked through is showing a uh, an average or, or normal applications workflow with some of the expected steps you, you would uh, think you would see in a CI CD workflow, but now including a way to create trusted unforgeable metadata or attestations about that artifact and how those can come together into a, a summary of that artifact called a VSA and then using that VSA to automatically enforce standards uh, at deploy time. 
And before we uh, completely wrap up here on the demo, I uh, just want to leave with a note that with all of this trusted data now being created, um, it doesn't have to end its usage just at deployment time or enforcement by a platform. Um, all of this trusted metadata, all these attestations can be used to further automate other existing governance, security, compliance processes that are likely to exist in enterprises. Uh, and as well, this is a new avenue for observability inside of IT. With all of this, uh, these new attestations and what they are describing, uh, organizations are able to better see what kind of security or compliance posture um, their IT org has. And as well, if there's any organizational changes that uh, might be coming in, you can see ahead of time what impact those security changes might have on existing delivery teams. So with that, that concludes our technical demo on automated governance. Thank you for watching.